we are live good evening welcome to episode number 380 and number 55 in the oculoplasty module today for the international master class we have a treat or should i say a targeted treat we have dr hakan dimitri joining us from kellogg eye center university of michigan usa and he'll be talking about targeted therapy in orbital disorders he really does not need an introduction but just for every all the audience out there he completed his medical degree from the hasetep university turkey and his ophthalmology training in istanbul faculty of medicine istanbul university turkey he then went on to do his fellowship in ocular oncology at wilsai hospital under the mentorship of dr jerry and carol shields uh he also has a fellowship from the american society of ophthalmic plastic and reconstructive surgery in eye plastic orbital and facial cosmetic surgery service at kellogg eye center university of michigan he completed his ophthalmology residency training at the De department of ophthalmology henry ford hospital currently he is in the staff of kellogg eye center university of michigan Uh, as he is richard n and marlin k with him professor he is the director of the ocular oncology and a member of eye plastic orbital and facial cosmetic surgery service he is the recipient of senior achievement award from the american academy of ophthalmology and he has authored 200 journal articles and given over 160 presentations and lectures at various ophthalmic meetings he is also the author of more than 10 book chapters and editor of a book he holds patent application about the photoacoustic imaging of the eye and intravitreal drug delivery with nanotubules so we are very it's a pleasure to have you on this platform on i focus and um we all are looking forward to this lecture thank you very much dr san and dr militika thanks i really appreciate for this nice introduction i will i'm feeling very honored to be with you and to share my experience the pleasure is all ours i really really appreciate and okay great so and first of all i would like to thank you very much i know that it is morning for me but it is evening for you guys and you are spending your friday evening after probably a long clinic day with me i really appreciate and i really thank you very much and it is even if it is virtual to be with you guys all together it is very very nice for me and it is i'm very very honored so today i would like to talk to you talk i would like to talk or mostly to share my experience actually about the targeted therapies for periocular and orbital tumors with the recent understandings of the underlying pathological pathways uh, in the periocular and then orbital tumors we start to use the targeted therapies especially for this pathological pathways and these targeted therapies become an very important tool in our toolbox for this advanced periocular and orbital tumors what are the most current ones or maybe the what are the most popular ones we as i will touch up first about the targeted therapy and then in the second part i will talk about immunotherapy and i will go a little bit more targeted therapy in the lymphoma group so let's look at in the eyelid especially the advanced eyelid tumors we know that in the basal cell carcinoma hjk pathways plays a very important role and we have an inhibitor right now for the basal cell carcinoma for the hjk pathway inhibitors similarly for the eyelid and conjunctiva melanoma group we have BRF and MAC inhibitors and they play a very important role in the treatment of the eyelid and conjunctival melanomas so let's start with the basal cell carcinoma and with the hjk pathway signaling this this pathway is very important in our uh, in the normal cell differentiation and the normal cell growth 
in a regular cell, this hedgehog pathway is inactive. But when the cell turn into the, where the trigger pulls for the cancer process, the oncogenic process, this pathway become active. What are the key players of this pathway? The one is patched. It's the transmembrane receptor. The second one is another transmembrane receptor, smoothened or SMO. These are two key players of this pathway. But there are other key players in these pathways, like SUFU, suppressor of fuse, or GLI-1, GLI-1. These are four important components of this hedgehog pathway, uh, pathway. So what happens in basal cell carcinoma? Now we really know about the, the pathways and the pathological process that's happening in the basal cell carcinoma. Regularly, the patch uh, receptor or patch protein is inhibits, inhibits the SMO protein or SMO receptor. This inhibition keeps the pathway inactive. So the cell division continues in a very controlled manner. But if something happens, if the connection between the patched and smoothened breaks up, then suddenly the pathway become active because smoothened moved its place and pulled the trigger. And then when the trigger is pulled, the cell proliferation starts and then the, we see the basal cell carcinoma. This pathway is not only in the basal cell carcinoma, but in the other tumors like medulloblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, glioblastoma, and the multiple other tumors, this pathway pl uh, plays an important role. This is a very, I found this is a very funny slide. The patched and smoothened, they work together. And patched controlled smoothened. If patch is faulty, which means that if there is a mutation in the patch protein, it cannot control the smoothen and the, the, the pathway becomes uncontrolled growth. Or if there is a faulty or if there is a mutation in the smoothen, then this time the patch again cannot control the smoothen and then the pathway starts to work out. And then this uncontrolled cell division happens and this leads to the basal cell carcinoma. Luckily, we have a blocker right now. Actually, we have two blockers, two inhibitors. The one of them is Vismodejab and the other is Sunidejab. What does the Vismodejab or the Sunidejab does? They come and they block the smoothen protein or the smoothen receptor. So the pathway becomes inactive again. That's how this works. This we learned about these drugs or about 12, almost 12 or 15 years ago. And around 12 years ago with this main paper in the New Journal of England, uh, these drugs get an FDA approved and then introduced into the clinical practice. In this, I think the first article is in this one about this topic. They showed that in 63 patients with locally advanced Continuous basal cell carcinoma, the 43% of these patients responded to the Vismodejab therapy, and 21% of them had complete response. At, and the mean duration of the response was almost eight months. So this was the first time that uh, we can show that medically we can treat the locally advanced basal cell carcinoma. And this led to the FDA approved of two medications, the one of them Vismodejab, which is very commonly used in our practice in the United States. And then the other is the Sonidejab. That's a little bit less commonly used in the United States currently. And they are currently approved for locally advanced basal cell carcinoma, which are not eligible for surgery or radiation, or which are recurred after the primary surgical excision. They are also approved for the metastatic basal cell carcinoma, which we see very rarely, actually. So recently, we look at the literature. And then, we, based on our review, we found so far 384 patients were reported and 
uh, treated with the vismodejab therapy. If you look at the overall response in 80, 384 patients, 75% of them showed a response. These patients, I want to tell, these patients are the patients who have periocular basal cell carcinoma. That's like, that's how we see in the clinic all the time, very advanced patients. And 75% of them showed their response at a mean follow-up of 14 months. And about 43% of them required an adjuvant surgical therapy, which means that they received the medication first, we saw a response, and then we treated the residual therapy in 43, per, residual tumor in 43% of the patients. And then the treatment, start of the treatment, and then to the surgery time was around like in the first, in six months. So again, in the literature, unfortunately, not all the patients saved from the exenteration or advanced surgery. If you look at that, about 6% of the patient required exenteration. And then what was the durability of this treatment? The After the patients are treated with modejab, about 8% of them develop recurrence, again, recurrence of the basal cell carcinoma in the periocular lesion, per periocular area within the 20 months. This is considerably low rates, actually, if you think about that, if you block a target, a pathway, and then you get a good response, and then only the 8% develop the recurrence. Unfortunately, these medications has side effects, both Vismodejab and Sonidejab. They have, unfortunately, have some side effects. The most common ones is the loss of sense taste or loss of the, the, the feeling of the food, basically. That's the most common side effect. And then the patients develop muscle spasms, especially in their legs. And now I think we start to learn how we can prevent the muscle spasms. We, we can use L-carnitine, we can use pickle juice, and then I think we can prevent the muscle spasms in these patients right now. The patients develop alopecia, as you see in this patient. They lose weight their appetite decrease. But so uh, how long does it take for this side effects to major side effect is around five months, actually. And if you look at the how many of these patients stop the medication, you see that about around one little bit less than one third of it stop the medication in about five months. But luckily, most of the side effects were the grade one side effects, which is tolerable. But it's one third of it in the grade two, and about 10% of it was in the grade three categories. So this is what the literature shows to us and what we learned from the literature. So let's look at our own experience right now. For example, this patient, he was a 61-year-old male who had multiple basal cell carcinomas. On the right upper eyelid, that invades anterior orbit, he cannot open his eye. You can see the big basal cell carcinoma in the nose and in the mouth area. Six, after six months of Vismodejab therapy, the, all the tumors regress significantly. And after nine months, there was almost no visible tumor, actually. And you can see that how he's smiling after the nine months right now. So these patients, we are almost more than a year follow-up right now, and he, we didn't see any recurrence so far. He stopped his medications after this great response and showing no recurrence. This is a 66-year-old female. She had this basal cell carcinoma on the left lower eyelid and shows some anterior orbital extension. So what we, 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 I saw this case first, I recommended surgical or medical uh, to use Visma Dejab. She disappeared. And seven months later, she came back with 
the tumor is slowly growing. And then you can see that now the almost all of the left upper eyelid is involved. You can imagine how big surgery it will be and then how much reconstruction it will take to excise this tumor and to rebuild the left upper eyelid and even the cheek, cheek area. So we this time, after this much advancement, we put this patient on only with Modegep. And after seven weeks, you can see that the patient, how much she responded to the Vizmodegep. And we used this medication for six months. The tumor significantly improved. Almost, I don't, I didn't see up after six months any residual tumor. And she has a significant left lower eyelid ectropion, but any oculoplastic surgeon can easily fix this left lower eyelid ectropion with some flaps or some skin grafts, actually. It is much easier to build, uh, fix this and ectropion rather than the, try to build the all left lower eyelid. So these are the, some examples of the primary use of the hedgehog inhibitors in the treatment of the periocular basal cell carcinoma. Is this the only usage? For example, this was an 85-year-old woman. She had 22 years of history of uh, basal cell carcinoma, multiple surgeries. And about six months ago, she noted any one, basically. So what would you do for this case? You will say exenteration. That's in the orbit. You said that it goes inside the orbit already. It is very extensive. But she doesn't want, she's 85-year-old. She doesn't want any exenteration. So we put this patient on immunotherapy. Unfortunately, she started to develop some side effects. But the tumor responded beautifully, actually. The left upper eyelid become retracted, and then she developed lots of leg of thalamus and exposure keratopathy, and she started to develop some side effects. So what I did, I excised that the left upper eyelid, and I reconstruct the left upper eyelid again. And as you can see, after reconstruction, she looked really good, actually. So the... Vizmodegep, you can use it as a primary treatment, but at the same time, you can use it in the neoadjuvant setting to decrease the tumor size so you can excise the tumor itself. This is another patient. So how this, this is an 80-year-old female again. Again, a, uh, again a case, she has this basal cell carcinoma. She tried all this natural medications, but the tumor continued to grow. It never uh, stopped. So I see at this stage, and then she doesn't want any exenteration or any surgery, actually. So we, we put this patient on Vizmodegep therapy. She did very well, as you see. After a year and everything, the tumor completely regressed. She has some left, over eyelid, left lower eyelid retraction, but the uh, she can close the eye. She didn't want any surgery to be done. So she just disappeared again. But this case, learn, teach me something. What is the duration of this medication? Is this medication, this patient is going to come back again? Or is this patient is going to never come back again? So about almost like a close to the three years later, I get a phone call from the family saying that her tumor came back. And then it was about two to three years, this tumor came back again. And then at this point, her medical situation was really deteriorating and she didn't want to have any surgery, but the tumor wasn't as bad as the previous. And then the family just managed the, um, the left eye with topical ointments and keeping the left eye actually moist. And, but she was happy, she didn't lose the eye or she didn't went through and extensive deformative surgery. But we learned that the tumor can come back if you, maybe if you follow them long enough. So I now we start to see this evidence. What is the long-term follow-up of these patients who showed response to the hedgehog inhibitors? 
So this, this is a very nice multi-center study, actually. They look at that the 116 patients who showed complete remission of that locally advanced basal cell carcinoma. The, the, they found that the median recurrence free survival, when there is no recurrence of the basal cell carcinoma, is around like 18 months. And around three years, 40% of the patients were recurrence free. So the recurrence happens is about 60% of the patients. But the good news is 40%, they didn't develop any recurrence at three years. So what happened to this 40% of the patients who develop recurrence? The, the half of them retreated with Vismodegep again. So again, this, this, half, this half of the patients, around uh, if you 75% of them showed some response to the Vismodegep again. So this taught us that the, maybe the Vismodegep can be a chronic treatment chronic kind of a treatment for these patients. You can treat, see the response, and then if there is a recurrence, you can treat it surgically, or you can continue to treat these patients, basically. So we look, we try to understand why this recurrence is happening, and then what is the underlying mechanisms of the recurrence. So this was a, another study from our group, VISORP trial, and then we look at that the patients who really um, show their response to the Vismodegep therapy. And then we sample the tumor before and after the therapy, basically, to see how is the regression pattern is. So what we see actually, these patients, some of them show the complete response, some of them show the partial response. So what we see in this study, actually, the Vismodegep, when you use the Vismodegep, the tumor breaks into pieces and certain areas, the tumor completely dies, but there are very small islands of the tumor. These are very small areas and mostly around the adnexial structures, actually. And then we show that the, the, we use this, the keratin or glee one as a marker to see where the residual tumor, and then you can see micro tumors in the, some samples around the, um, especially around the adnexial structures and the hair follicles. So this teach us something. So the tumor breaks down, so it doesn't completely shrink. There might be small areas, and then this might take years for the tumor to grow back again. So we look at the mutations, do we change really the uh, mutation profile before and after the Vismodegep. So what it shows actually, um, when the resistant certain mutations, especially the mutations who are resistant to the Vismodegep are much more low frequency in pre treatment samples, but when you treat them with the hedgehog inhibitor like Vismodegep, the, the, the resistant certain type of mutations that give resistance to the Vismodegep, they increase actually. So, uh, so it creates some kind of a bias towards the tumor resistant mutations. So, um, so what we understand from there, that the, the, when you are resecting the tumor after the Vismodegep therapy, our standard approach to get that the complete negative margin may be less productive in these patients. Maybe we have to think a little bit differently in these patients in the surgery uh, and then and in the follow-up of these patients. And in this topic, I will tell one more thing. How so why, like if this pathway is really important in the basal cell carcinoma? Why not everyone responds? Or why some response partially and why some response uh, completely? I think the, the, the key here is where the mutations are, what type of mutations are, and then the what pathways compensate when you block the hedgehog pathway. We now we learn that the certain mutations 
like in the SMO protein especially, are more resistant to the, the, our, the current inhibitor therapy. If the new inhibitors come into the market, maybe we will be able to block all of the SMO pathway. And then the view, our response rate will increase. Uh, but the, the other pathways can be a kind of an escape mechanisms. So maybe we can start to use some combination therapies for this advanced basal cell carcinomas. That will be, the, I think, the future for this treatment. So in a very small summary, the hedgehog pathway inhibitors, currently two of them, is effective in the base uh, in the management of basal cell carcinoma as a monotherapy in the primary treatment or in the neoadjuvant setting, and then it provides a kind of a globe preserving alternative for these advanced patients. So from here, I'm going to switch the gear towards the melanoma, first eyelid and conjunctival melanoma. We know that. The BRAF mutation is about present around 50% of, of all cutaneous melanomas. And then 90% of them BRAF V60E mutation. In, if you look at the skin literature, the derm literature, if you give up a BRAF and MAC inhibitor, you get around like 76% response rate uh, for the cutaneous melanomas. So can we use their approach to the periocular eyelid melanomas or conjunctival melanomas that we see a little bit more common. We show that, and the others, and there are multiple papers about that, there are basically two, uh, four types of subtypes of conjunctival melanoma based on the mutation. Uh, if you look at the mutations, you can separate them four main subgroups. The one is BRAF mutation carries. This varies from 13% to almost half of the patients. It's very variable, depend of the region. It could be NRAS mutation. This also about one third of the patients to one quarter of the patients. And the other is the NF1 mutation, around like 40% of the patients. So these three groups, BRF, NRAS, and NF, NF1 mutations are three main subtypes in the conjunctival melanomas. And there is a one group, about 10% of them, that we couldn't find any um, mutation, actually. This is an interesting group. And what we know right now in conjunctival melanoma, there are main pathways that plays an important role. We just show that the BRAF mutation is important almost up to 50 or 35% of the patients. So the BRAF mutation is an important pathway. The others are NRAS mutation, uh, NRAS pathway, which also leads to the PI3K pathway, which is another promising pathway, and the other NF1 and CD11. These are four main pathways in the conjunctival or in the eyelid melanomas. So now we have drugs, at least for BRAF mutations and MAC inhibitors, which are the same pathways, actually. If you look at the BRAF pathway, it starts from BRAF and MAC and ERG. This is the pathway. Oops. And then, and then now we have another medication. It is PI3K pathway medication that's coming into the trials right now. So this was a 69-year-old woman who had multinodular diffuse pigmented conjunctival lesion. Came to the office with this uh, pigmented lesion on the left side. I flipped the lower eye, upper eyelid. You can see this huge mass on the left upper eyelid and invading into the orbit. What's the treatment? Exenteration. So we biopsy it, and then we look at the mutations. This patient's luckily was BRAF positive. So we put these patients on BRAF and MAC inhibitor combination. After three months, the tumor shrinked down significantly. So this patient was a first when he come, the only way to treat this patient is exenteration. There is no other way. But three months later, this tumor significantly decreased. Now you can excise the tumor, and then you can reconstruct the area. As you see, I excise this tumor on the left upper eyelid, 
and from the conjunctiva, and I I um, reconstruct. Then the eye is in place, and she um, there. As you can see, she didn't have any ocular complaints. She was very happy. This patient survived about a year, and the one year later, she developed metastasis, unfortunately. And we put this patient on immunotherapy, but she developed severe side effects from the immunotherapy, and then she passed away. Maybe if I did it again, after I excised everything, maybe I could have put, I should have put this immuno check, immune checkpoint inhibitors or inhibitor immun, immunotherapy right after I finished the reconstruction. That's that's what this case taught me. So recently, again, we reviewed the um, targeted therapies for conjunctival melanomas. And this is published in the Green Journal, in the OPRS Journal. And so far, it looks like uh, in the literature, there are about 18 cases who are treated with BRF and MEK inhibitor treatment. And one third of them showed a complete response. Around one fourth of them has partial response. 10% of them has stable disease and around like 28, which is like 30% of them had a progressive disease. So it shows that in certain advanced conjunctival melanomas, the BRF MAC inhibitor combination has a role basically. It can really important role in as a primary treatment or as a uh, neoadjuvant treatment actually. Now, I'm in this part of my talk, I'm going to switch it towards the immune checkpoint inhibitors. These are the most hot topic in medicine right now. And then we know that the, the most, one of the most recent, one of the Nobel Prizes in recent years went to the inventor of the immune checkpoint inhibitors. Currently, there are two types of immune checkpoint inhibitors. One of them is the CTLA inhibitors. This is a protein that prevents our T cells to attack the, the tumor cells. And then the other ones are PD1 and PDL1 inhibitors. That is, I think at this point, PDL and PDL1 inhibitors are extremely commonly used in multiple cancers and change the, 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 the treatment of the landscape of the treatment in multiple cancers. So let's look at how we can apply these treatments to the periocular lesion, to the orbit, to the conjunctiva. We know that the uh, squamous cell carcinoma is the most common malignant conjunctival tumors, especially in India and in the, in, especially in, the, in India, and much more common than here. What we know about the conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma? First, we know that it's a very highly immunogenic tumor. And the second is it is related with the UV signature, more than 75% of the patients. So, and the thirdly, it expressed the PDL1 uh, which is the ligands that attaches to the PD-1, basically. That's the very important point that the, prevents the tumor cells to be attacked by the T cells. It express, if you look at that, almost all of the patients express certain level of PD-1 and PDL one And as the tumor become more advanced, the expression of PDL one increases dramatically, actually. So this, this makes the... Scum, uh, conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma and an ideal target for the immune therapy actually this was a, this is our group that we are publishing our results right now in our experience as you can see like uh, almost more than 75% of our patients uh, ha it has a high tumor mutation burden this is a very important, one of the important biomarkers, actually, that predict the response to the immune checkpoint inhibitors. If the patient has higher tumor mutation burden, then the more likely to respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors. So let's look at this case. This was an 82-year-old gentleman who had squamous cell carcinoma on the uh, left eye inferiorly. 
I'm sure that you guys see this kind of tumor much, much more common than me. I treated with excisional biopsy and then did cryo. And then after that, I put plaque radiotherapy because it was invading to the iris, as you see in this UBM. It went well, almost 10 months later, he came with a huge recurrence. What's the treatment? Exenteration. You have to exenterate this patient. So we put this patient on immune checkpoint inhibitors. Seven months later, after seven cycles of pembrolizumab, which is the Keitura, or which is the one of the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors right now, the tumor shrink down significantly. And this response that we saw around after seven cycles persisted for almost two years. And this patient, after two years, he passed away because of the natural causes, actually. But it was a dramatic response. This was another patient who came, who had a, a squamous cell carcinoma of the conjunctiva on the left lower eyelid. And you can see that it involves all the inferior orbit. This time we use in this one the semiplumab, not the pembrolizumab, the semiplumab, which is another immune checkpoint inhibitors. They are in the same category, different companies. Then, as you see in this patient, this, this patient was uh, recommended exenteration in the left eye. But as you see, after 10 cycles, he responded beautifully. And around after two years right now, there is no sign of recurrence. Originally, the recommendation for this patient was exenteration in the left eye, which is not, uh, not. I mean, you cannot argue that that's the standard of care, but the immune checkpoint inhibitors showed an impressive response in this patient. So in the literature right now, we start to see more and more papers coming about this immunotherapy for conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma with orbital extension or extensive uh, periorbital involvement. Again, we in our article, we look at the literature right now. This was only for conjunctival tumors, actually. There are uh, seven cases in the literature for only conjunctival, advanced conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma. And then around, we see a 75% complete response rate right now, which is, um, which is very impressive. So the other question is immunotherapy in the conjunctiva squamous cell carcinoma is, does this work for the CIN? This was an 84-year-old woman who had bilateral conjunctival CIN. This didn't have, at least my biopsy sites didn't show any invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So this was, this patient, especially the left eye, was previously treated with multiple uh, excisions, cryotherapy, she used interferon therapy, she used uh, topical 5-FU, didn't touch. So I put this, and then uh, she didn't want like so much surgery, she just wanted to keep everything under control. Um, so we put these patients on immunotherapy, actually. We used a semiplumab. After 10 cycles, it didn't, it didn't completely clean up the tumor. It didn't completely clean up the tumor. It decreased it to a certain degree, but the tumor still persisted. So it looks like immunotherapy is not as effective as on CIN as much as it is on squamous cell carcinoma. And if you talk with the medical oncologist, they observe the similar finding in the skin also. It works very well for the cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinoma, but it doesn't work that well for the actinic keratosis, actually. It is interesting. And in this topic, I will, one of the things that which amazes me right now is especially the advanced conjunctival or periocular squamous cell carcinoma with perineural invasion. This was a patient that I recently saw. He was a 71-year-old gentleman who had previous history of right uh, squamous cell carcinoma on the temple region. Years ago, it was excised. And then it was really done a really, really good job, a little bit scarring here that maybe you may notice it. And now he came to the clinic with right upper eyelid ptosis and the right eye was completely frozen. No movement at all. And then the, we did all the workup. 
and it shows that the patient's uh, cranial nerve three, four, six, and seven was involved actually. So we put this patient on immunotherapy. One year later, you can see that the, the, the right upper eyelid starts to open up. He starts to see with this eye. He cannot fully move, but he has an eye. And the, maybe the most and most importantly is for one year, his tumor looks really complete, uh, under, good, uh, under good remission, under good control, and he's alive. In old days, when I started this career, when the patients developed perineural invasion or CNS involvement, they didn't survive as long as how they survive right now. And this is a, on the left side, you see another patient who has huge squamous cell carcinoma with perineural invasion. And then after again, a year of immunotherapy, the tumor partially responds. He looked really good and his tumor looks under good control. So this shows that maybe immunotherapy will have big effect on the squamous cell carcinoma actually with the perineural invasion. So I will, what about in the melanoma group? What about in the conjunctival melanoma? The conjunctival melanoma is is a little bit different than the squamous cell carcinoma because it is not that immunogenic as much as the squamous cell carcinoma. It is It has immunogenic tumor, but not as much as that. And then because of this immunogenic, because of this, and because that we are really using the immunotherapy for conjunctival, uh, for skin melanoma, this has been started to use for the conjunctival melanoma also. And this is one of the cases that first cases in the literature, actually, they use the pembrolizumab, which is an immunotherapy for conjunctival melanoma. And then you can see that the tumor responded beautifully. And after a one year follow-up, there was no recurrence. There was a there is a recent review of literature. There are around like 10 cases right now with orbital involvement secondary to the conjunctival melanoma. And if and then they found that all the all these 10 cases responded to the immunotherapy, the ones happening, uh, the ones that who has orbital involvement secondary to the conjunctival melanoma, they com almost completely respond. But the ones that who are metastatic one, they uh, partially responded. And then they look at also the literature that the ones without any orbital uh, invasion, and they also see that about 42% of the patients, there is a complete resolution. So I think this is can be explained because they are not that highly immunogenic as much as the squamous cell carcinoma. That's why the response rate in the melanoma is a little bit lower compared to the squamous cell carcinoma. Can it be used in the, um, in the neoadjuvant setting? For example, this is a 60-year-old woman who had conjunctival melanoma treated with excisional biopsy. And then later, she presented with nosebleeds almost 10 years later huge tumor in the nasolacrimal duct area sinuses it's full what you need to do this patient at this point maybe exenteration maybe do a huge resection so we put this patient on immunotherapy after two immuno ipilimumab which is a ctrl receptor and then pdl basically um, inhibitor and then the tumor significantly decreased as you can see, there was a little bit residual kind of a thing in the left in the sinus. And then we excise that. And then this patient, at least two years, there was no recurrence, but she developed a pancreatic cancer and then she passed away because of the pancreatic cancer. But her eye was in place and then there was no recurrence for this patient. So the immunotherapy seems is an important, is an management of the conjunctival tumors, but maybe a little bit less effective compared to the squamous cell carcinoma. And the lastly, I will touch for a couple minutes about the lymphoma. We know that the mouth lymphoma is the most common ocular adnexial tumors, and this is mostly seen in elderly patients. It is mostly unilateral, and it comes as salmon-colored lesion. 
And the, the treatment is external beam radiotherapy. And in old days, we used to use higher dose, but right now we decrease it to the lower dose, to four gray. And then the maybe the long, the, in the short term, the response, the response rate is very similar to long term. And then uh, the high dose radiation, which is 24 gray, compared to the four gray, which is low dose radiation. But I think in the long term, there are some studies starts to appear that maybe some of these patients who receive low dose radiation start to recur. And then we see around like success rate around 85% right now in the some literature. But one thing is interesting in the mild lymphoma. It is CD20 positive. It is very strong CD20 positive. So can we use the CD20 positivity for our advantage? And there is a drug right now, the rituximab. It, is a, it attaches to the CD20 B cells, basically. And then it has multiple uh, mechanisms. It has been drugged for a long time. And now there is even the biosimilar ones, which is relatively cheap. So can we use this one on mild lymphoma? We, we all have experience of this using the systemic use of the rituximab for the orbital lymphomas, as we see in this case, that shows a significant response. And then in this case, in the conjunctival uh, lymphoma, you can see again, just by giving the rituximab, a sustainable long-term response. So this is the systemic use, but what about can we use locally? As we see in this patient who has a conjunctival lymphoma on the medial cantal area that goes to the superior fornix. So what, what I did in this case, I excised a certain amount of it and I inject rituximab to the area basically around the orbit and around the conjunctiva. And this melted almost all of the mild lymphomas as you can see here, and then it was a sustainable response up to the two years. So recently we published our results. We have around like 15 eyes of these patients. Our My protocol is involves giving 50 milligram of rituximab in 5 cc with one month apart. And then the, most of the patients received tw uh, like 12 eyes received two injections actually. And we see around 75% response rate. And the, low, uh, the side effect profile was relatively low and well tolerated. And this was another patient, for example. He had bilateral um, conjunctival mild lymphoma on the superior fornix and inferior fornix. He didn't want uh, any, there was no other systemic involvement. And then he didn't want to go through the systemic therapy. Yes, you can excise this and then cryo it, basically. But I tried to retox him up, injections around the eye, and it complete the response. Sometimes, not all of the patients are giving the complete response, though I have to tell you. It is, some patients give a partial response. They regress and they stay. So you have to follow these patients much more carefully. I think the immune, the mutation profile that affects the, the pathways involved in the formation of the lymphoma is a little bit different from one patient to the other patient. And that definitely affects the response rate. And what about in the orbital lymphoma? This was a one patient, it's a very interesting patient. Uh, she had Sjogren's syndrome and mild lymphoma in both eyes. We treated with the um, rituximab. She responded beautifully and then 10 months later, she come up with recurrence. So I give her, rather than systemic this time, I give local injections into both sides. And right now, this patient is about four or five years, and there is no recurrence. And her sugar is much better, actually. She feels that her eyes, the, the dryness improved significantly, and she's very happy right now. I haven't seen it for a long period of time, this patient right now. We, again, we look at the literature about for conjunctival um, lymphomas and systemic rituximab. It seems in the literature around 63% complete response by giving systemically, and about 33% shows a partial response giving systemically. And the, um, if you look at for the intralesional injections, like how I do it, then again, we see around like 75% uh, 
uh, response rate. It is a little bit lower than the external beam radiotherapy, but maybe it is easier in certain patients. So it seems that the rituximab therapy has either is a systemically or intralesionally can be an option for some orbital and conjunctival multi-lymphoma patients. And I would like to thank you very much for sharing your night with me and all this invitation and then all the teaching that I learned from you guys, actually. That is, over the years, I learned a lot from your experience, especially Dr. Hanover's experience. I have a... Uh, when I started doing this targeted therapy, when I first, when I was very junior at the Michigan in those days, I wanted to give some systemic chemotherapy that how he was using for skull cell carcinoma, for the sebaceous carcinoma, but nobody was biting it. And nobody, one of my medical oncologist colleagues didn't believe me or they didn't want to try these things. But over the years, when this targeted therapy is immune point starts to come and they gain confidence about it, they were much more willing to listen and then to follow the path, basically. And thank you very much for everything. Thank you so much, Dr. Hakan. That was a beautiful, beautiful lecture. And uh, believe me, this is a very difficult topic. But with the clinical images and the responses that you're showing, I think this is a very exciting new field that we're dealing with. Yes, I think the future will be. I think the future we will learn, we will develop different uh, alternatives and then strategies for different patients. Then this is coming. I mean, we will all see in a short period of time. Absolutely. Maybe we will do less surgery. Yeah, I, I believe so. But uh, so I just have a couple of questions for you, if it's OK. Can I take those? Yeah, of course. So, uh, Dr. Dimitri, you mentioned uh, that, you know, you showed us really good response with Vismodegib uh, for basal cell carcinoma. When, when, when you feel that it is indicated in a patient, whether in the neoadjuvant setting, do you uh, do... Uh, do you check for the genetic mutation of the tumor before starting it or the mutational burden in case of uh, basal cell carcinoma before starting this treatment? Uh, yeah, that's a good thing. For basal cell, we are not doing. For squamous okay. and then the melanomas, we are routinely doing. But basal cell, I'm not doing. The reasoning is, I think, this hedgehog pathway is very consistent right now. Okay. Very consistently. But I think that's a very good topic and it will be the new avenue for us. Why some patients responding? Why some complaint? Why mm -hmm. partial? I think that is the new thing that we got to start to look. I'm not doing it routinely right now, though. Okay. Okay. And then you mentioned that once we treat them with this therapy, uh, the surgical excision that we do the margins it's less predictive so then what if what how what is how do you go about with the surgery in those cases do you still follow the routine frozen section or the most technique and uh, this that's a that's a very difficult topic basically this, so far my experience and i am uh, this is the guide i right now currently i only excise the area that i see that i okay i am suspicious clinically Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and I cut that area and I send it to the uh, pathology. I usually I'm trying not to do the frozen so much because uh, these are very difficult cases after they treat it. The, some of the histopathology changes and you yeah. cannot completely try to, uh, the frozen section. So I excise, I let them, the pathology look at about a day or two and then give me a routine uh, Answer, just give the regular pathology, give me an answer. And after that, I go and if I needed to excise positive margins, I excise more. If there is no positive margins, I am at the negative margin, I stop over that. So you do a secondary reconstruction? After I do secondary get... reconstruction, exactly. Okay. Yes. I okay. don't do the primary Perfect. reconstruction right now. Right. So, and do you also consider adjuvant radiotherapy in these cases for the local disease? control uh, in a very rare cases yes we have one or two cases right now used the vismodejab did great couple of years passed came back 
we went mm-hmm. the, and then we went there we re-excised it the the second re-excision was a huge re-excision because this case was involving the skull base at that point and then we excise it and then we give the radiation just the adjuvant setting just to prevent the recurrence that's we do it still do it yes okay. but in a very rare extreme cases not everyone okay okay uh, and uh, you mentioned that uh, cins don't respond as well as uh, ossn itself is does it have maybe possibly anything to do with the mutational burden again in terms of the that response? is i think that is one reason that's for sure um mm-hmm. i think the mechanism is a little bit different their mutation mm-hmm. profile is about the same the cin and squamous cell carcinoma they care they carry very similar mutations if you look at the tp53 mm-hmm. is the most common mutation in both of them actually but when it turns into the invasive the immunological response is changing we look at the histopathology slides of those two patients that uh, I had. I have, we published this one in the cornea and then we look at in one of them especially, we try to localize where the T cells are. It was interestingly in those cases, the T cells was not in the intraepithelial level. They were in the stroma level. <laughs> so the immunologic environment is different. And I think that's the reason that you see a different response. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think one of uh, our panelists has a question. Do you want to go ahead with that? She raised her hand. Sorry. Do you have a question? As for conjunctival melanoma, not all of them uh, respond to immunotherapy, and uh, how can we choose another medication? Uh, how about MMC or flat? Yeah, I think that is the, um, like, for the conjunctival melanoma or the same thing applies for the squamous cell carcinoma associated with CIN or conjunctival melanoma associated with PAM, basically. The same idea applies. So for maybe for the conjunctival melanoma or squamous cell carcinoma, especially the invasive part, use the immunosystemic immunotherapy. But for the CIM part or the PAM part, use some topical therapy, mitomycin or 5-FU. It's a kind of a combination therapies that will be the future, basically. Okay. All right. Uh, and finally, I just want to touch upon this because I think because of paucity of time, you could not cover the uveal melanoma part of it uh, yes but uh that is another interesting topic that i think we should have a separate class on uh tebentafas that is a newer area uh currently we are only using it in the metastatic setting but is there i mean is there some trial going on or any start any case reports that have been uh, reported on its use as in just as an adjuvant therapy in patients with HLA? Okay, uh, yeah. So I will tell you, I, I, because that's a totally different uh, yeah. coming to, I mean, it's a very exciting things are developing in the uveal melanoma. Maybe we can talk about one day. It's a totally different, separate, mm-hmm. different thing. Okay, so there are two medications. The one is Tapantafas, and then the it is FDA approved. Mm-hmm. but metastatic setting. The adjuvant setting, we don't know right now, but neoadjuvant setting, if you give it in a neoadjuvant setting, can you see a response or not? There is a trial is starting right now about to use it tapantafas early to shrink the tumor. Uh, what the time will show, that is, we don't know. But if you look at the metastatic, t- the cohort, about, uh, less than one third of them, the metastatic tumor decrease in size, actually. Yes, yes, so yes. maybe there might be a potential for tepentifas. Mm-hmm. And then the other medication that is coming also in a trial is PI3K inhibitor. There is another pathway, PI3K inhibitor. Especially in the Australia, there are this, this drug also was used for metastatic uveal melanoma. But there is a right now, there are a couple cases around in the world that the people 
the people who have uveal melanoma in the eye and metastasis at the same time, when they use these medications, the tumor shrink down actually in the eye too. Okay. So there is some hope. I think is a coming hope right now in the next couple of years for either PI3K pathway or from the Tepantafas pathway. Basically. It's a little bit different pathway. So there might be something coming. We'll see. Okay. okay, and then we can look okay. at that in a different, totally different perspective, actually. Yes, yes. All right. Um, does anybody else have any questions? All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Dimitri. you very much. Was, Thanks uh, a lot for sharing nice. your Friday night yes. with me. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Um, it's <laughs> our pleasure. And uh, so uh, before we call it a night, I would just like to uh, inform you all that we do have the physical eye focus for the year 2024 uh, that will be held in Hyderabad, uh, June 9th to 16th. And uh, there are only limited seats that are available. So uh, register quickly for it. And there are also hands-on sessions for the same. Uh, also, I would like to inform you that next week, Wednesday, uh, the eye focus will be on uh, short cases in oculoplasty. And I really hope you join us for that. So thank you very much and good night.